Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate. And uh, we were talking in part one with our panel about a National Assembly that's gotten a major makeover. Three quarters of new MPs elected after Sunday's second round of legislative elections that have given a big majority to 39-year-old President Emmanuel Macron with us to talk about it. Romain Dupérez, Macron supporter with Lawyers en Marche, Lawyers uh, on the Move. How would you translate it? Uh, Juren, the Lawyers on the Move, yes. Lawyers on the Move, okay. Uh, Boris uh, Jamais Fournier, National Delegate for the Socialist Party. Welcome back, welcome back as well to sociologist Davina frau Meggs, who teaches at the Sorbonne University, and uh, Pierre Briançon of Politico.eu. Uh, we mentioned uh, so many newcomers, so many newcomers beholden uh, to this president, the initials of his movement, En Marche, E-M, the same as the initials of his name. And of course, the other factor, record high abstention, uh, there were a lot of elections over the last uh, a year in France. Now, the leader of the far left, his name is Jean-Luc Mélenchon, elected, for, by the way, for the first time to parliament at the age of 65. He calls this record abstention rate a citizen's strike against the system. Cette majorité... This swollen majority in the National Assembly does not, in our eyes, have any legitimacy. That is, if any such majority can claim to have the legitimacy to execute a coup on our social rights. This destruction of the public social order is being planned with the repeal of the Labour Code. A, co a coup on social rights. Your reaction to that, Romain? Ah, to some extent, is a cause of concern because the language is very inflammatory and really calling for very strong and violent. I mean, acts. the reason he's saying it is because Emmanuel Macron on the campaign trail said he was going to push for deeper labor reforms and he was going to use both legislation and do what's called ordinances, which mm. are basically decrees. Exactly, but as you said, he did so. He did say so during the campaign. He was extremely clear about the fact that he would do so. So people were, went to the ballot knowing this, and he did get the majority in the fourth, uh, for last Sunday of election. So it's very strange then to say that it wasn't clear and the majority of people would be against that because they didn't go to pool. If they were so much against that, they would have voted against it. Why does he need these ordinances, these, these decrees? So I, I don't want to go into much details, but it's a much faster way of getting the reform done uh, because then you don't have the very complex, intricate process of having a law adopted by the two chambers of the parliament. But you do have a debate at the parliament to, to uh, authorize the government to do so, and then you do have a law to actually homologate the ordinance which has been rendered. There will be 48 meetings between the government and the trade unions to, to go to this reform, so there will be a plenty of room for debates. Uh, wait, despite wait. despite um, having a majority, the, the, the socialists also needed a decree. They needed what's called the Article 49.3 of the Constitution, uh, bypassing Parliament to pass their own labor reform. Why is labor reform so hard to pass in France? Well, it's a very uh, complex issue and also one that um, changes um, the life of working families very, very deeply. So obviously, it's very controversial. You, you just said um, that you didn't want to go into uh, details. That's a very en marche thing to do because actually uh, Macron talked about uh, uh, labor reform, but he didn't. That's, that's why 48 meetings are actually needed because he didn't go into the details at all uh, of his labor reform. And when people understand that it's going to go against their rights, protecting them less in terms of keeping their jobs, which they are uh, attached to, um, I think they will change their minds on, on Macron but on this issue and on a number of different he issues. He didn't say he would protect them less at all. And actually, there are many, he's gonna do, many heads of reform, which is actually giving more power to the trade unions to be more involved on in the, the management the, of the yeah. company. We can go into more details. I don't on think the, there's a purpose the, today, but mm. I'm very on happy to do the so. Process, I mean, the, 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 the idea of that abstention takes some legitimacy away from this government is purely bollocks. The uh, the the highest <laughs> put it bluntly turnout the highest turnout rate is in the uh, Insoumis district. Mélenchon and his allies, if 
really the abstention rate. The abstention rate. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The turnout was the highest in those, uh, the the lowest in those uh, districts. So it doesn't take away anything. Second. On the labor reform, the, the ordinance is not a decree. It's a way to not to cut parliament out of the process, but to speed up the parliamentary process. In a way, it's a little less supposedly anti-democratic than the, 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 the Article 49.3 that you mentioned that was used by, uh, by Manuel Valls. It is simply a debate before the government acts and after the government acts. And the idea is because Macron wants to, this is a reform that will take time to produce results. Okay, so there was, the, there was this bill, which is uh, the, one of the two signature pieces that yes. Emmanuel Macron has put forth. The second one uh, was this uh, moralization of public life. And no, 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 no. The restore confidence in the political process. It did change Bill. name. It yeah. did change name. If well, excuse me. They're not talking about morals yet. They're talking about restoring confidence. Restore it makes sense because the minister who's carrying the reform is actually involved in several cases where he took, he might have uh, taken money from yeah, the European an EU Parliament. parliamentary payroll yeah. um, a scandal or a whiff of scandal for, for sure. He says he's done nothing wrong. This is uh, F François Bayrou, the coalition partner of Macron inside the Modem uh, party. Um, one of the MPs uh, who was a government minister who's just resigned his ministerial post to uh, just devote himself to the National Assembly, Richard Ferrand, a right-hand man to Macron throughout the past year, former socialist, um, many are critical saying he should have just resigned and not run for parliament, uh, just to clear his good name in a separate corruption scandal. Why didn't he resign? Uh, so there, there's no corruption scandal uh, against Mr. Ferrand. There are some allegations that... Uh, personal enrichment before he went into public life. Not, not, not really. It's more like uh, nepotism really, than, than it's his girlfriend at the time. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, I don't think there were enrichments. They were just a, a building rented to a private company uh, under market rules. So, so I don't think that, that goes that far. Uh, Mr. Ferron was indeed a great team leader for our movement for the last year. Uh, he, he was very involved in the campaign. Of course, he can obviously not be a minister and then uh, an MP. And asking but would he, will he be credible as a majority leader in parliament? Because ah, that's, that's what for, he wants yeah. to be. That's for a newly elected candidate to decide. And in, so the, in the French system, you don't resign from a, the government, from cabinet, to go. That's and what hey, Dominique Strauss Kahn did in the to, 1990s. To go ahead, uh, because when you have presidential ambitions and because your your your, your uh, term in, in in government has ended, but you're not appointed to a government and then resign four weeks later to run for head of the parliamentary group. I mean, you, you remember that Ferrand two or three weeks ago was supposedly the guy destined to become head of parliament, chair, speaker. And uh, so it's, uh, it's probably a way for Macron to, uh, you know, kick the can down the road. And if, if judges ever put Ferrand under formal probe, uh, his resignation will hurt less than if he had been a minister at the time. So yeah, now all we're about we're having levers and buffers. Macron himself, let's talk about the president for a moment. Um, he started this day after his big win in those legislative elections with, I guess you could call it a dramatic entrance. Uh, this is the opening of the Paris Air Show, and there you see him, Davina Frau Megs, getting out of an Airbus A400M military transport, of course, to tout the virtues of Airbus. It's an air show, after all, and you're trying to sell planes. Uh, but this is, this is reminiscent of what we saw on Inauguration Day when he went up the Champs-Élysées in a, in a military vehicle. Uh, what's your, what's your, what are your thoughts when you see these images? Well, uh, a sort of new kind of patriotism and uh, pride, and I think it's part of Macron's optimism for the country to say that uh, we have. Uh, Hang on, we have interesting. Pa uh, yes, we we have an army pride, that is solid. People and watching us in places like you know in Africa when they see their leaders, uh, you know, c coming out of military transports, it's to show you're a strong man, isn't it? And also that, but and that's in the continuity with Hollande, and that's the one point that really worked for Hollande is to be the strong man uh, outside with all the uh, terror attacks that we're dealing with. So he's already also sending this message around uh, our presence in in terror and, and uh, against um, terrorism. I think plus this patriotism, which is what's interesting about uh, Macron, is that he is a, a Europeanist. But uh, wanting France to uh, have a, a strong uh, position in negotiations and with a vision of uh, the EU that probably will be 
about uh, bringing uh, strength to the EU on uh, the international that, stage. That, that said, this is a presidency that is really heavy, heavy-footed. Uh, a bit thick on symbols and signs, etc. So the Champs Elysees in an Ar Renault armored vehicle, like and the age we're treating, we're sending uh, text to reporters at the same time. So this is to show he supports the military, as if we doubted that for, mm. for some reason. So I wouldn't be surprised in this case if there had been text as well as it did. You see that he came down from the Airbus military. So True, there is an air show. He has to show that he supports French industry, the French military. But he's, again, a bit thick on it because he had to prove something, a 39-year-old well, who obviously has never served in the military because he didn't have to. Uh, and so he has to show that he will be the big president, the strong president one, that the French expect. One quick thing. Uh, obviously, Macron is great with communications. We've seen this over and over again. And sometimes it's, it's, it's good for the country. I mean, what he did with Trump, what he did with Putin, obviously, it's a lot of show off. But it's, I, I think in, uh, in the end, the, the outcome is, is, is great. It's but message. Yeah, it doesn't always uh, is enough. Uh, it's not always enough. And, and the, just one point I want to I want to make uh, going back to the Ferrand case. Now we're down to three ministers involved in a in a scandal with uh, Bayrou, uh, Goulard and, and de Sarnez. And by the way, our international viewers need to know that the justice minister François Bayrou called on a reporter uh, asking uh, them to stop their investigations on this very case. I think this is an attack on independent press. And, and to be honest, I mean, he was um, called to order by by the Prime Minister himself. Yeah. Well, there's a, there's it a, was, it's very serious, though. Defense, co very we serious should call though. it the Beirut defense. It was not pressure because it was yes. off the record. Okay. <laughs> so Apparently he does that I want to get back to something that Davina Framig said, which is, of course, Macron running uh, unabashedly as a pro-European across the Rhine, leaders of both the Christian Democrats, the ruling Christian Democrats of Angela Merkel and their social democratic rivals, applauding Macron's win in those legislative elections on, on Sunday. So are ordinary citizens, like in the city of Cologne. Well, the voter turnout was not at all what one could have hoped for, but it's a great change for French politics, as we've already heard. The traditional parties have lost the voters' esteem, to say it bluntly. Now one can only hope that Emmanuel Macron will achieve what he intends to do with his momentum and his youth for all of us in Europe. Well, yes, he does have a lot of power, but he also needs a lot of power to implement the reforms France desperately needs. And we wish him best of luck. B desperately needs. Sounds like the Germans are telling the French, well, tighten their belts a bit. Right? That's what I'm reading between the lines of what that man says. But uh, basically, it's congratulations, but it's not going to be a free pass from Germany, is it? Of course not. I mean, we have a lot to do on, the, on many things. It includes the labor reform, which in, in terms of political capital would take a lot to, for, to Emmanuel Macron. Emmanuel Macron was very audacious to actually go before the voters but on a European-like uh, platform, because you know, at the time the English voted for the Brexit, and there was so much criticism. It was very audacious and dangerous, actually, electorally speaking, to, to try to gather French around a European uh, program and he did so but of course now that's just a starting point and we have a lot to do to lead the Brexit uh, negotiation of course and uh, I mean yesterday's vote will probably help uh, in having a strong voice in this negotiation not that much strong but clear voice in the negotiation and then also to bring some more social rules uh, in Europe uh, for the future. You know, there's a lot of Macron envy right now across the English Channel because... Well, curiosity, envy, and people are, you know, breathing a sigh of relief, especially in Germany. I mean, this is a country, you're talking Germany, the main partner, I mean, the historical partner of France, who has been worried for at least 10 years, if not more. The total, nothing happened under the Chirac presidency. Big disappointment when, uh, when uh, Sarkozy came in and promised rupture and reforms, and of course, even bigger, if possible, disappointment when uh, François Hollande came to power. And so you have, you have that, uh, plus the big worry that France is the sick man of Europe, which has been permanent in European negotiations. Toys, but, and Emmanuel uh, Macron doesn't have a party machine of his own. He's not going to make he does big, not. He's not going to make big slashes in the civil service, which is what the Germans would like to see. The, the Germans would like France to reform. Does that mean, as you said, tightening the belt? 
which would mean cut the budget deficit or cut spending. Maybe not. It means reforming the economy and then worry about, about deficit spending. You can't do both. You can't have structural reforms, serious structural reforms, and then cut the budget at the same time. This is called pro-cyclical in technical terms, and then, and then you hurt the economy. He's lucky. Once again, I mean, Macron has had countless streaks of luck because, and this guy, in this uh, instance, the economy, the Eurozone economy is picking up. Um, the, the, the ECB will not tighten the screws any, in, any, uh, any time soon. And so he's got a window of opportunity. He, th he does it because he thinks France needs to do it, not to please Germany. And then he's got the diagnosis right. And he's doing, and, and then the question is, of course, how fast he goes and, and what the, what type of opposition he will encounter, not in Parliament, but outside Parliament, whether in the streets or you know, social movements of any type, and he will have to do a lot of convincing, I think, outside Parliament. One thing is to have a legislative program, implement it and see it through. The other is to convince the rest of the French people, and that's where abstention counts in a way. A lot of people didn't vote for him, and he has to convince them that this is for, he, he produces results and this is for the good of the country. I just want to mention one thing. It's fine to talk about tightening the belt. It's better to talk about who this effort is going to weigh on. Uh, I think redistribution of wealth is, an, is a very important issue to embed policies in reality. It's a very important issue that has been very, uh, not very much discussed in the presidential campaign and even, even less so in the legislative campaign. And I think it's a very important uh, point to understand to, to really grasp how these policies are, are going to be implemented in, in reality. And it's a question that um, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, Emmanuel Macron tackle. I have tackle. to quote uh, François Hollande to you, to redistribute, redistribute wealth, you have to create wealth first. Sure. Yes, hence the permanent problem. problem. Well, you have to re-engage young people, which is uh, at the moment the ones who are the most disengaged. And that's going to take pedagogy a pedagogy of learning how to participate in the process, maybe not just in the financial part of the process, but in uh, voicing your issues and, and negotiating uh, a bit by bit, issue by issue, uh, where, where you want to Did go. Did your students vote in these legislative elections? Not yesterday. I will not tell. This is I'm, I'm, uh, my professional uh, pr uh, pr um, as they say, but you talk priority about, not to say that. But, but you talk about in, in engaging young people. Why don't yeah. they feel c like they're implicated in it? the system? I think uh, that for a long time they've been uh, hearing promises and promises about work, uh, which is why I suspect Macron is targeting uh, work first, because uh, uh, in places there's 40% uh, young youth unemployment. And they have seen that these promises uh, were not carried through either by the right or by the left. Uh, and so they are, I think they're, they're waiting. Uh, and I think Macron's uh, challenge, really the, the, the biggest one, is to bring them in. And I guess that's why he's zeroing on to women and zeroing on to younger people, because at least he hopes that he'll have representatives on the ground who will be able to uh, stir and, and maybe change a little bit the, the, the software that's been going on around in French politics, where, where young people were systematically excluded from the politics. I mean, the, the average age of parliament just showed how difficult it was it to, might be, to go and, and reach out to them. The, so there's going that, to be a pedagogy part, of participation that is need, absolutely need to convince people that what he's doing yeah. is right. He might have a problem with a so-called Jupiterian stance he has yeah. adopted, the, re, you know, re, the president retiring on Mount Olympus and then leaving the prime yeah. minister and the ministers and now the deputies to deal with the earthly things. People elect the president in the French system both to be Yes, the king, symbolic and, and Republican king, but also they want someone who can muddy his hands and mm. can actually d do things and deal with things when, when there is trouble. And I think the simply very aloof position, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the president uh, who supports the military, who does commemoration like, like uh, no one else, uh, he, at some point he will have to come down from, from Mount Olympus and that's where we're going to see whether he's got real political skills. And we shall see indeed. Uh, Pierre Briançon, I want to thank you. I want to thank uh, Boris Jamais Fournier, uh, Romain Duperrier, as well as uh, Davina Frau Meg. Stay with us, though. Media Watch is next. And we say hello to uh, Emma James. Uh, Hi there. Uh, 
Emma, we've, we've been uh, looking at this complete redrawing uh, of uh, France's uh, political landscape, really like places that voted for one party for decades, that, and now it's all changed. Yes, absolutely. And it's interesting to see what kind of reactions there are online, especially from the cartoonists, because they often have a slightly sideways look at uh, what's happened. Uh, this from Placide has Emmanuel Macron uh, changing the face of the Assemblée Nationale by changing the name to the Assemblée Macronale, <laughs> um, which is rather a nice little take on it. Um, this one has uh, Macron portrayed as a peacock, and that, of course, is a, sort of, um, a cartoon uh, idea of how those seats measure up. Uh, slightly, perhaps, uh, incorrect, I think, looks slightly extreme. Yeah, the pie is a little big there. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> but I think the, the key factor really is the fact that they've drawn Macron as a peacock. Um, some certainly feel that he is getting perhaps a little too big for his boots. Um, there's a really interesting article in Time magazine uh, written by uh, Vivian Valt, who is a regular here on France 1 Cat. Um, and what I noticed in this is that in the first um, paragraph alone, she uses the words astonishing, crushing, gigantic and stunning. Um, I think she's really trying to hammer home the message of just how big this victory was for Emmanuel Macron. But she points out that there's another thing that has surprised the uh, French pollsters, and that is the level of optimism here. Um, because she says, in a country famous for its public grouching, uh, political ob observers say they are amazed to see the country in the grip of hope rather than anger. But of course he has it all to do. Can he maintain that feeling of hope um, or will the anger... Yeah, it is the honeymoon period. Very much so. Right now, we'll wait and see um, how, it, how it looks in a few months' time. Um, the Economist points to the fact that this wasn't necessarily the size of victory that we um, had anticipated or some had anticipated, especially after the first round. Uh, they're calling it landslide, not avalanche. Um, and what they say in this article is that really uh, it's a measure of how quickly expectations in France have shifted that this result was seen um, by some as disappointing. Uh, now, the other thing that people have been disappointed in is, of course, the level of turnout. This cartoonist uh, has a woman saying to her husband, uh, are you staying lying down instead of going to vote? And he says, yes, but I'll get up to shout about it. Um, and I think possibly that is uh, something that, that may be true. The hot weather certainly, I think, affected turnout. Yeah, and you had the tennis in the first round. There was the French <laughs> Open final. <laughs> Absolutely. There's always something, whether it's the rain, it's the sunshine, whatever. Um, but people this time around are certainly blaming the heat to an extent. Um, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, the far-left candidate for La France Insoumise, he has said that basically the failure to turn out amounts to a general strike against the new president, using very French uh, terminology really to explain what he th feels is happening. He's now pledging to mobilise people in opposition uh, to uh, the new French uh, president. Um, he tweeted this less than an hour after polls closed, uh, saying that from now on the strength of the abstention must become the force of the citizens' revolution. Uh, so some people wondering whether this honeymoon period will last long with Voices like this, clearly he has a lot of support out there and a lot of vocal support too, uh, even if he doesn't have uh, what would be deemed a, a strong opposition in terms of the number of numbers in uh, the national, at the Assemblée Nationale. Uh, of course, Davina Frommeggs, this was the first time that we'd had open primaries in France for both the left and the right. So some people voted eight times. There really was a sense of voter fatigue. Uh, yes, I think so. And the idea that uh, things were decided also in the last, uh, the very last round. Um, dog days, certainly, but the idea that um, uh, enough was enough. And um, people who, uh, who didn't go to vote to blame, I suspect, not so much uh, Macron, because the Macron people showed up, but uh, the other uh, candidates and sent them a strong message. And so I think it's uh, now the turn to the opposition to hear not just Macron, we're focusing on him, but uh, we have to hear um, what the other parties are going to do. And they, it's a sound, really resounding um, uh, signal that they have to shape up and they have to change the way they've done politics uh, they have to develop new opportunities to do politics uh, in other ways. 
Yes, it's interesting to see in response to that tweet from Jean-Luc Mélenchon, a lot of people saying, us not going out to vote doesn't mean that we support you. No. Um, no. And a lot of other people pointing out this uh, ironic um, turn of, of fortunes, uh, the fact that uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon himself was elected in an area where there was a very uh, high abstention rate. Uh, so mm. this Twitter user saying, not legitimate, uh, Mélenchon should stand down. Uh, a bit tongue-in-cheek there, but certainly it's best not to criticise something that perhaps you have benefited from mm. or people could raise questions about you. All right, we'll have to mm. leave it there. I want to thank you, Emma James. I want to thank our panel once again. Thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.